Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third cardiovascular lecture. This is going to cover uh, a little bit more fine detail of the heart, where we're going to look at some of the cellular makeup of the heart and electrically how the heart functions. So this is going to be a pretty intense lecture. And uh, here in just a moment, you're going to see some of the other material from Bio 137 that you might want to review if you haven't already. So let's go ahead and get rolling with our not really attendance questions. What prevents blood from the right ventricle from moving into the right atrium? What returns blood to the left atrium? And during an action potential in a neuron, in the depolarization phase, what ions are moving and in which direction? So go ahead and try to answer these. Pause your video if you need to and see if you can come up with the answers before I tell you what they are. All right, so what prevents blood from moving from the right ventricle into the right atrium? Well, blood shouldn't go that way. Remember, blood goes from the right atrium into the ventricle and then from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk. It should not ever go back the other direction. On the right side of the heart, in between the atrium and the ventricle, there is the right AV valve, which we call the tricuspid valve. And that is what allows blood to move from the atrium into the ventricle, but prevents blood from moving back the other direction. What returns blood to the left atrium? Well, blood is coming into the left atrium from the lungs. So we have left and right pulmonary veins returning blood to the left atrium. Now there are two left pulmonary veins and three right pulmonary veins, but we can just collectively call them the left and right pulmonary veins. During an action potential in a neuron, in the depolarization phase, what ions are moving and in which direction? So this is what I was just talking about. If you are not comfortable with action potentials, if they didn't sink in or if it's been so long that you just kind of flushed them out of your mind, before watching this lecture, it's really, really a good idea to go back and refresh yourself on action potentials in both neurons and in skeletal muscle. That was from Bio-137. We're going to talk about that today in the heart, but it's expected that you already understand action potentials very, very well. So in a neuron, in the depolarization phase, this was when the graph was rising. And during that phase, those voltage-gated sodium channels are open, and sodium ions are rushing into the cell. They're coming into the cell bringing their positive charges with them and making the inside of the cell less negative, more positive. All right. So let's start talking about cardiomyocyte anatomy. But first, let's look at that word. Let's unpack what that means. Cardio, heart. Myo, muscle. Sight, cell. So cardiomyocytes. That's the real term for a cardiac muscle cell. So I'm going to use both of those terms, cardiac muscle cell and cardiomyocyte. I'll use both of them, and they mean the same thing. Now, cardiomyocytes, when we look at them under a microscope, they are striated. Remember, skeletal muscle, when we looked at it under a microscope, it was striped. It was striated because of those sarcomeres. Well, Cardiomyocytes are also striated because they also have sarcomeres. And just like skeletal muscle, it contracts using the sliding filament theory. Hopefully that's something you remember. The actin and myosin, they don't get shorter. They slide past each other, so the cell gets shorter. Now, skeletal muscle was really, really thong, really, I'm sorry, really, really long and straight. And unlike skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle cells are very, very short and branched. 
It's kind of like a Y or a W that somebody laid over on its side. So this picture is on page 717 of your textbook. And if we look up here, we can see that there are some stripes. Now, we're not talking about these very dark stripes. We'll see those in just a minute. We're talking about these very, very faint stripes. Those are the striations that we talked about. And here, one cell runs from this dark stripe to the next dark stripe. So the cells are not very long. But we can also see that here, this cell branches. This is what I was talking about, where it's like a Y laid on its side. This cell branches. Here's uh, another cell that branches. So these dark lines, these are called intercalated discs. And intercalated discs are where one cardiac muscle ends and the next begins. And the two cells are joined end to end. So down here, you can see that intercalated disc. This cell, which branches, it ends right here, and the next cell begins, and they're joined here at this intercalated disc. And that's what we're seeing up here with these dark red stripes. Now, intercalated discs are very, very specialized cell junctions. Think back to cell junctions in Bio 137. There were a few different types, and here, we're going to use some of those types and really, really modify them. So what we've done is we've taken one of the cells and pulled it away, and this is that intercalated disc. We're seeing where one cell ends, and we've just taken that other cell away so that we could see that intercalated disc makeup. And the things that we see at the intercalated disc First, we see something called interdigitating folds, and that's these little rounded mounds right here. These are the interdigitating folds. And essentially, these are just ways that when we put the other cell back in place, they fit together kind of like a puzzle piece. They just interlock with each other. We also have a couple of different types of mechanical junctions. We have fascia adherens, and desmosomes. So all of this yellow right here, this is the fascia adherens. And it's kind of, you could think of it as Velcro. One cell has a bunch of little pieces that stick forward. The other cell would have a bunch of little pieces that stick forward. And the two pieces grab hold and anchor onto each other the same way two pieces of Velcro would. And that's the fascia adherens. The desmosomes, also called anchoring junctions, are spaced a little less frequently. So the fascia adherens runs continuously. And then the desmosomes are kind of spaced sporadically. And the desmosomes, when I teach this to my Bio 137 class, I say it's kind of like if you're ever on a boat and at the end of the day when you go to tie the boat uh, to the dock, you throw a rope across and you tie it around that little anchor bolt there. That's how a desmosome works. It holds the cells together really, really strongly, but it allows freedom of movement. So when you anchor a boat uh, to the dock, the boat's not going to float away, but it can move around. So here, the desmosomes hold the cells together really, really tight while still allowing some degrees of movement. And we have electrical junctions, gap junctions. So gap junctions, remember, it's like a tunnel that runs from inside of one cell through to the inside of the next cell. And gap junctions allow stuff to move from one cell to the next really, really efficiently. In this case, we're going to be seeing how ions move from one cell to the next. And remember, ions, they carry electrical charges. So if ions move from one cell to the next, really what we're doing is we're passing a charge from one cell to the next. So all of these things, the two types of mechanical junctions, the interdigitating folds, the gap junctions, which are electrical junctions, 
These are all modifications at the intercalated disk. So let's compare cardiac muscle cells to skeletal muscle cells, and some of this we've already said. So skeletal muscle cells have neural excitation only. So any electrical activity that runs through a skeletal muscle cell comes because a neuron sends an action potential, an electrical signal, to that skeletal muscle cell. Cardiac muscle cells, some of them are self-excitable. That means some cardiac muscle cells actually generate their own electricity without that electricity coming from a neuron. Skeletal muscle functions in motor units. So remember, motor units were when we needed a stronger contraction, we contracted more muscle cells. Cardiac isn't that way. The heart is all or none. The entire heart contracts or none of the heart contracts. Skeletal muscles, if we look at it at the microscopic level, it's got a really extensive sarcoplasmic reticulum. Because remember, the calcium involved in a contraction in a skeletal muscle cell was stored in that sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it needed to be really extensive, really elaborate to hold all of that calcium. Now in cardiac muscle, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is much less elaborate. It's kind of shriveled up. It's still there, but it's not nearly as developed as it is in skeletal muscle. And that's because in cardiac muscle, most of the calcium is going to come from influx. So that calcium is outside the cell, and then it will come into the cell to cause a contraction. Now, there is some calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that is released for a contraction, but not very much at all. Most of the calcium comes into the cell from the outside of the cell. Skeletal muscle cells, we can get tetany. Remember, tetany is that sustained contraction. If you ever clench a muscle and hold it there, that muscle will stay contracted practically as long as you want. In cardiac muscle, that's not possible, which is a good thing. We don't want our heart to contract really hard and then stay contracted. That would be a bad thing. So it's not even possible in cardiac muscle cell. Skeletal muscle can be aerobic or anaerobic. It can function with oxygen, or it can function in the absence of oxygen. But cardiac is practically entirely aerobic. It needs a lot of oxygen. As soon as we start depriving it of oxygen, as we saw at the end of the last lecture, we start to develop problems. So switching gears a little bit, this picture is on page 718 of your textbook. And what we're talking about is uh, something called the intrinsic conduction system. And all of these yellow areas, these are the parts of the muscle, uh, they're very modified muscle cells that are called autorhythmic cells. Autorhythmic cells. And these autorhythmic or autorhythmicity cells are capable of generating their own electricity. They do not require any input from neurons. They generate their own electricity. Now, since they generate their own electricity, they really don't function to contract. The rest of the heart muscle contracts. These do not. So we will also hear them called non-contractile cardiomyocytes. So here we've got a bunch of different terms that kind of mean the same thing. Autorhythmic cells, autorhythmicity cells, non-contractile cardiomyocytes. All of these mean the same thing. And these are all parts of the heart that generate electricity on their own. But they don't do it just haphazardly. When a heart is functioning correctly, things go in a very, very specific order. So let's look to see what that order is. Up here at the top of the right atrium, 
very close to the superior vena cava. There's something called the sinoatrial node, or the SA node. This is sometimes called the pacemaker of the heart, because really, when a heart is functioning correctly, this little patch of cells sets the pace for the entire heart. This guy generates action potentials on its own at the rate of 100 action potentials per minute. 100 action potentials per minute. We say that is the intrinsic rate of depolarization. The intrinsic rate of depolarization. Now, this is going to be related to resting heart rate, but we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. So right now, we're just going to say the SA node, the sinoatrial node, depolarizes on its own without any input from anywhere at the rate of 100 times per minute. Now, when that happens, every time it depolarizes, there's going to be a wave of depolarization that spreads across the heart. It's going to spread through the actual contractile cardiomyocytes that make up the walls of the atria. So we see it spreading across and down the atria. Every time the SA node depolarizes, a wave of depolarization spreads across and down the atria. Now, if we look here, there is something that looks very, very similar to the SA node. This is another patch of cells. Now, if we were looking at an actual heart, just with the naked eye, we would not see these. They do not stand out from the other uh, muscle tissue of the heart. But here, right at the bottom of the right atrium, right next to the right ventricle, there is something called the atrioventricular node, or the AV node. Once this uh, wave of depolarization spreads across and down the atria, some of that electrical signal gets picked up by the AV node. And in response to that, when this electrical signal, these action potentials, get to the AV node, it's kind of like when a runner passes a baton in a relay race. The AV node receives that electrical signal, that action potential, and then generates another action potential of his own. So, let's put two and two together. The SA node depolarizes on its own 100 times a minute. So, without anything else interfering, that means that the AV node would respond by generating an action potential 100 times per minute. But now we're going to come back, like I said, and modify all this in just a little bit. Now, coming off of the AV node, there is a bundle of those autorhythmic cells. This is called the bundle of Hiss, or sometimes it's also called the atrioventricular bundle, or the AV bundle. The AV bundle really is the more proper term because we're kind of doing away with parts of the body named after people, so bundle of Hiss isn't really used that much anymore, but bundle of Hiss is kind of an old school term, and most people in the medical industry and teaching are kind of old school, so you will still often hear bundle of Hiss. I still use bundle of Hiss pretty commonly. So the SA node generates the action potentials it spreads across and down the atria. The AV node responds by generating another action potential that then spreads down through the bundle of Hiss. Now, that bundle of Hiss runs from the AV node across the wall of the right ventricle until it gets to the atrioventricular septum, that wall that separates the left and right ventricle. And once it gets there, that bundle 
actually splits in two. We can see there's one here and one here. And we call these the left and right bundle branches. So that action potential coming from the AV node travels through the bundle of Hiss, and now it's traveling down the left and right bundle branches towards the apex of the heart. And once it gets to the apex of the heart, it starts to fan upward. And if you hold your hand up in front of you and spread your fingers as wide as you can, that point where your fingers all start to spread out, that's kind of what starts to happen to all of these fibers of these autorhythmic cells. They spread all through the walls of the ventricles. And all of these fibers are called either Purkinje fibers or the subendocardial conducting network. Again, Purkinje fibers is old and outdated. Subendocardial conducting network is the newer term. I still use, and most people still use, Purkinje fibers. So, one last time, let's go through this. The SA node depolarizes. That resulting action potential spreads across and down the atria. Eventually, some of that gets to the AV node, who responds by generating an action potential of his own. That action potential travels through the bundle of Hiss, down towards the apex in the left and right bundle branches, and then up through the walls of the ventricles in the Purkinje fibers. And as it spreads up through the Purkinje fibers, that starts to spread through the actual contractile cardiac muscles of the ventricles. Okay, so this is just electrical activity. We have not talked about contraction at all. Right now, we are only talking about electrical activity. But, if you remember in Bio-137, when an action potential travels through a muscle cell, it leads to a contraction. So we're going to build on this in just a little while. But for right now, all we're talking about is electrical activity spreading through the heart. So, let's talk about heart rate and something called ectopic focus. The SA node, we just said, is the pacemaker of the heart. And in a healthy, functioning heart, without any outside influence at all, the SA node generates an action potential 100 times per minute. Something called an ectopic focus is any area of the heart other than the SA node that generates an action potential. So, sometimes some things can cause random parts of the heart to start to generate their own action potentials. Let's go back and look at our picture here and talk about some other things, and then we'll come back to the ectopic focus. If something were to happen and the SA node was damaged and it no longer started to generate action potentials, all of these other cells that are autorhythmic cells are capable of generating action potentials on their own. So, something takes out the SA node and it no longer functions, the AV node can take over. But there's a catch. First, now the atria are no longer going to depolarize because we're only going to follow through this conducting network now. We don't get any activity in the atria because the SA node is gone. The second catch is the AV node is slower. It generates action potentials about 60 to 80 times per minute on its own without any outside influence. What if something happened and the SA node and the AV node were both taken out? Then the bundle of Hiss would take over. If something happened there, 
then the bundle branches would take over. So each one of these areas is capable of generating action potentials on their own. That sounds like a lot of stuff could take over if the heart was damaged in some way. But reality is if the SA node is taken out, the AV node can sustain you for a while until you can get help. But if the SA node and the AV node were taken out, the bundle of hiss, while it does generate action potentials, it does it much slower and it would not be sufficient to keep someone going. We would not have enough action potentials to cause enough contractions to keep someone alive. So really the AV node is where we would draw the line. Although reality says all of these other guys can generate action potentials on their own. So if we go back and look at this term ectopic focus, remember that's anything other than the SA node that can generate an action potential. That means that the AV node the bundle of hiss, the bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers, those are all ectopic foci. They are all able to generate action potentials. But really, when we talk about an ectopic focus, we're talking about sometimes randomly, some part of your atrium can suddenly start generating action potentials, or some part of your ventricle can suddenly start generating action potentials. So it's not part of this. A conducting network, it's something completely different. So when we talk about an ectopic focus, it could be one of these areas here, or it could be just somewhere random on the heart that has started generating action potentials. Now, ectopic focus, that can actually come about um, similar to an event that causes atrial fibrillation, so they're kind of similar, but an ectopic focus is really common in uh, people who are drug users, like stimulant drug users. So when we get to atrial fibrillation a little bit later on, we're going to come back to talking about ectopic focus, because an ectopic focus can actually cause atrial fibrillation in some cases. Now, here I have a different set of numbers than what I said just a moment ago. AV node 40 to 60. Well, a minute ago we said the AV node depolarizes on its own at about 60 to 80 beats per minute. Well, when we are at rest, when we talk about resting heart rate, what is your resting heart rate normally? Normal resting heart rate is about 75 times a minute. If we go back and look at the heart, Normally, what's controlling the pace of the heart is the SA node. The SA node depolarizes 100 times per minute. So, why is resting heart rate not 100 times per minute? Because resting is the key word there. When we are at rest, what's in control? The parasympathetic nervous system. We're going to see in just a little bit that at rest, the parasympathetic nervous system slows your heart rate down. So we, we say these happen without any outside influence, but there is almost always some sort of outside influence. So when you are at rest, the SA node is being told, hey, slow down a little bit. The parasympathetic nervous system, by way of the vagus nerve, slows the heart rate down. So the SA node is not depolarizing on its own, it's depolarizing at a slower rate because of the parasympathetic nervous system. So rather than depolarizing 100 times per minute, it starts to depolarize about 75 times a minute. And for every one of those depolarizations, ultimately, we get a contraction. More on that later. So the AV node, on its own, depolarizes 60 to 80 times per minute. But the AV node is being slowed down to 40 to 60 times per minute if the SA node was not doing anything. The remaining network, about 20 to 40 times per minute. And that, like I said, is not enough to keep someone going. 
So the cardiac centers. We're going to talk a lot this semester about the medulla oblongata. Remember in Bio 137, the medulla oblongata has a lot of functions that keep you alive without you thinking about it. And this semester, we're going to talk about most of those things. So right now, we're going to talk about the cardiac centers. Specifically, there's two of them, one called the cardioacceleratory center. That's part of your sympathetic nervous system. And the cardio inhibitory center, which is part of your uh, parasympathetic nervous system. Cardio acceleratory center sends signals to your heart to speed up. The cardio inhibitory center sends signals to your heart to slow down. And it's the cardio inhibitory center using the vagus nerve, which is what we see right here. The cardio inhibitory center sends signals to your heart through the vagus nerve, telling it to slow down, and that generates your resting heart rate. So here is going to be an illustration. There's sound, but really the sound isn't even necessary on this, so you won't be missing anything. It's just going to show you, here's the SA node, the AV node, all of those parts that we just talked about, and you'll see how that electrical system works. All right, so now we're going to have a thinking cap question. And I really like this, um, especially when we're in class and I can ask the class as a whole to raise their hand or to shout out an answer. Um, and these are neat videos if you can ever find them online. But the heart, like I've said several times now, can be can generate action potentials completely on its own without any input at all. Now it is constantly getting input, but it doesn't require that to generate action potentials. If you were to take someone's heart out of their chest and put it in a jar, which is what we see here, and supply it with all the nutrients that it needs, it would do something really neat. It would keep beating on its own in that jar, not connected to the body at all, because the SA node generates its own action potentials. So when we looked at this heart in a jar, it would be sitting there beating and looking like something out of a horror movie. Now the thinking cap question here is, if we had someone's heart and we took it out of their chest and we put it in a jar, how fast would it beat? Remember, resting heart rate is 75 times a minute. So, that's typically what I hear students say in class. But the key for resting heart rate is the word resting. And resting means your parasympathetic nervous system is in control. But if we take the heart out of the chest, it's no longer connected to the parasympathetic nervous system. It is only under the control of the SA node. And remember, the SA node depolarizes completely on its own 100 times per minute. So the heart would beat 100 times per minute. And it's a really neat video if you could ever find it. 
Okay, so now we're going to start to talk a little bit more about action potentials in detail. And this picture is on page 720, and the next picture we're going to look at is on page 721, and these are action potentials. Now, these could be action potentials from any of those autorhythmic areas, but this is specifically an action potential from the SA node. And what we're seeing is one complete action potential followed by another complete action potential. And we're going to talk about what's happening at each part. So sometimes you will also hear this called a pacemaker potential because it's an action potential from the pacemaker of the heart. But let's go through and see exactly what's happening. So this is an action potential generated by that SA node, picked up by the AV node, and passed through all those autorhythmic areas. First, we have this very slight incline right here. This is called specifically the pacemaker potential. This small part right here, the whole graph is the pacemaker potential, but also this part right here is called the pacemaker potential. Now there's a lot of numbers on here. You do not need to know them. This is not Bio 137 where I'm going to ask you about those numbers. You do not need to know them for this graph or the next graph. Here we are depolarizing. Remember, depolarizing, we're increasing in that voltage, and that's what we're doing here as it's going upward. So the pacemaker potential is part of depolarization. Why is it depolarizing? Because some voltage gated sodium channels have opened up right here, and sodium starts to rush into that cardiac muscle cell. It's a non-contractile cardiomyocyte. Hopefully you've gone back and refreshed yourself on why ions move the way that they move. Remember, sodium rushes into a cell when there's a pathway. So sodium is rushing into the cell, bringing its positive charge with it, and we get this depolarization. Once we get to threshold, something happens, and calcium voltage-gated channels open in addition to those sodium voltage-gated channels. And calcium high outside the cell, low inside the cell, so calcium also starts to rush in. Here we only had sodium coming in, now we've got sodium and calcium, so we've got a faster rise. This is more depolarization, but it's a much steeper depolarization because calcium and sodium are coming in. Once we get to a certain point right here, just above zero, again, number's not important, but we get to this peak right here, and a few things happen. Voltage-gated sodium channels close, voltage-gated calcium channels close, and voltage-gated potassium channels open. Sodium closes, calcium closes, potassium opens. Calcium and sodium stop coming in. Potassium, which is high inside, starts to rush out of the cell, taking its positive charges with him. So now the voltage starts to drop. We're repolarizing. And we get down here to the low point. Those voltage gated potassium channels close. Voltage gated sodium channels open and the sodium starts going out again, and now we're back to our pacemaker potential. And we do it again. So, a couple of things to notice here. The shape of this is very different from our action potentials from Bio-137. It looks different. Second, there is no pause in between one action potential and the next. As soon as one action potential stops, the next starts. And that's because of these special voltage-gated sodium channels. We're not going to talk about why they're special, but they spontaneously will open and that cardiac muscle will start to depolarize during this pacemaker potential.
So every time one stops, the next one immediately starts with no pause in between. One of these is one action potential generated by the SA node. So without any outside influence at all, how many of these would we have in one minute? Well, we should have 100 of them per minute. Or at rest, we would have 75 of them in one minute. So this is another set of graphs. And I wish that there were pictures of these graphs individually, but there's not. So what I'm going to ask you to do is first ignore the red line. We are only going to look at the green graph right now. So pretend that red line's not there. This green graph is another action potential. This is an action potential in a contractile cardiomyocyte. Remember, this was a non-contractile cardiomyocyte. The green is a contractile. So every time we get one of these generated by those autorhythmic cells and it spreads across all of the different contractile parts of the heart, it is going to cause one of these action potentials in one of those contractile cells of the heart. Every one of these leads to one of these green guys right here. So, what's happening in this green? Because it looks really, really different. First, down here we have a flat spot. There is some rest right here. But, once an action potential from that non-contractile cardiomyocyte arrives at a contractile cardiomyocyte, we go from at rest to immediate, complete depolarization in just a matter of an instant. That's because there's a very special type of voltage-gated sodium channel called a fast voltage-gated sodium channel. And as soon as some of those fast voltage-gated sodium channels start to open, it triggers more of them to open, and we get a very quick, practically immediate depolarization from rest to fully depolarized in a moment. Once we are fully depolarized, several things happen. Those fast voltage-gated sodium channels close, so we stop rising. But also, voltage-gated calcium channels open. Also at the same time, voltage-gated potassium channels open. Now, here, over here on the side, it talks about some of them opening, some of them not. Don't worry about that. that. That makes it more confusing than it needs to be. At number three right here, voltage-gated sodium channels close, voltage-gated calcium channels open, and voltage-gated potassium channels open. So several things start to happen. Sodium stops coming in because those channels closed. Calcium starts coming in because those channels open. And potassium starts going out because those channels open. So let's see what's happening here. The calcium is coming in, bringing positive charges. The potassium is going out taking away positive charges. We get this weird, almost flat area right here called the plateau. The plateau is because we have positives coming in and positives going out. And once we get to about right here, those calcium channels close, calcium stops coming in, and potassium continues to leak out, so we get Repolarization back to rest. <coughs> Sorry. 
we get repolarization back to rest. And if you see here, just like we saw over here in the beginning, we are completely at rest. In our non-contractile, our autorhythmic cells, there was no pause in between one action potential and the next. In our contractile cardiomyocytes, we completely come back to rest before the next action potential can occur. Why is that? Well, from the point that we start depolarization until the point that we are almost back to fully repolarized, there's an absolute refractory period. Hopefully you remember that term from Bio-137. If not, make sure to go back and refresh. But during this time, another action potential is impossible. We have to wait until we are all the way back to rest before another action potential can begin. The absolute refractory period is incredibly long in cardiac muscle. In skeletal muscle, it was really, really short. And if enough action potentials came in quick enough, it allowed for tetany. But cardiac muscle cells have a really long absolute refractory period. You have to come all the way back to rest before another action potential can do anything. And that is why tetany is impossible in a cardiac muscle cell that, can, that is contractile. So, we said one of these from an autorhythmic cell, a non-contractile cell, causes one action potential in a contractile cardiac muscle cell. Now, let's look at this red line. This red line is not an action potential. This red line is a graph of tension. The red line is a graph of tension. And the reason that they have them here on the same picture, there's actually a reason behind it, is it wants you to realize that the green graph, the action potential, causes or leads to the tension development and the tension relaxation. So let's see exactly what's happening here. When this red line is rising, tension is developing. That means that the muscle is contracting. The heart is contracting as this red line rises. But even though it's right to say the heart is contracting, when we talk about the heart, we don't really use the word contraction or relaxation. The contraction is called systole. Systole. S-Y-S-T-O-L-E. And the relaxation comes when this red line is dropping. Tension is going away. So relaxation, the term is diastole. D-I-A-S-T-O-L-E. Systole, diastole. And if we look at the systole, we can see that as soon as the depolarization starts, that's when we start to get systole. So we can say that in a contractile cardiomyocyte, depolarization leads to systole in that same contractile cardiomyocyte. And then here we can also see that as soon as we start to repolarize, that same cell goes into diastole. So re, uh, repolarization leads to diastole in the same contractile cardiomyocyte. Okay, so I know I keep saying the same things over and over and over, and that's just to kind of keep hammering these in and tying everything together, but let's go back and see the entire thing now in order. One action potential developed by those autorhythmic cells spreads across the heart 
and causes one action potential in a contractile part of the heart, which immediately leads to contraction and relaxation in that contractile part of the heart. For every one of these, you get one of these, and it causes one complete contraction relaxation. Every action potential that the heart generates is uh, followed by an action potential in a contractile part of the heart, is followed by a contraction and relaxation of the heart. Okay, that last little bit from when I first started talking about this up until the end of this, I encourage you to listen to that a couple of times just to make sure it all sinks in because this is how the heart works. And this is going to be built on by ECGs, which I'm going to talk about now, and which is going to be important for lab. I do not cover ECGs in the lab video, so you must learn the ECG part here. So what we see here is an ECG, an ele sometimes EKG. They're the same thing. ECG is in America. EKG is most of the rest of the world. EKG was developed in Germany, and cardio is spelled with a K in Germany. So that's where we get this. Electrocardiograph is the device, the heart monitor. Electrocardiogram is what we see here. This is the ECG, EKG. And this, what I tell people is an EKG is not a readout of an action potential or a graph of an action potential. It is a depiction of all electrical activity in the entire heart during one complete cardiac cycle. It is not the graph of an action potential. It is a depiction of all of the electrical activity in the heart during one complete cardiac cycle. Now the parts of the action, I mean, I'm sorry, the parts of the EKG, there's lots of them. We are not going to go through every single part. And I'm going to use terms that you will not use uh, when you get to your program. So I am going to talk about P waves and PQ segments and QRS complex, ST segment, T wave, but I'm also going to use some other terminology just to kind of better wrap your head around what you're looking at. So first, let's just kind of trace this out. We begin with the P wave. Then we have the PQ segment, this flat spot right here. Then we have the QRS complex, this big spiky part here in the middle. Then we have this flat spot right here called the ST segment. Then we have the T wave. And then we have this spot after the T wave. And then we repeat. One going from P wave to the end of the T wave is one cardiac cycle. So that shows everything that we just talked about during the last, you know, several slides. And then it repeats again. So one complete cardiac cycle results in one complete P wave through T wave. How many of these should you have in a minute at rest? 75 because one for every beat of the heart. Now, let's go through and see exactly what happens at each part of this EKG. We're going to begin with the P wave. Now, right here, just before the P wave, that's when the SA node depolarizes. So the P wave is when we get atrial depolarization. The P wave atrial depolarization. Now, here's some 
terminology that I want to introduce before we really get into this much more. We're going to talk about electrical events, depolarization and repolarization. And we're going to talk about mechanical events. So this is either contraction, relaxation. So that's systole, diastole. Those are the four things we're going to talk about. Electrical events, depolarization, repolarization, mechanical events, systole, diastole. And the other thing to watch for as we go through this step by step is every time one part of the heart depolarizes, the next thing that happens is that same part of the heart is going to go into systole. Every time one part of the heart repolarizes, then that same part of the heart is then immediately going to go into diastole. So it's always going to go in that order. Depolarization, systole, repolarization, diastole in one part of the heart. So let's go back to our graph here, our EKG readout. We have the P wave atrial depolarization. The PQ segment, what happens there? Well, what did we just say? So here in the PQ segment, we're going to have atrial systole. Now, when the atria contract, it's not going to be a significant contraction. If we were to watch the heart, the atria just kind of quiver. They're not very muscular at all. They do not really play much of a role in a heartbeat. Then we have the QRS complex, this big, giant, spiky area. And there's a lot that goes on in the QRS complex. That's why it looks so significant. You do not need to know what happens at Q, what happens at R, what happens at S. I just want you to know all of the stuff that happens during the QRS complex. So, during the QRS complex, three things are going to happen. Since we've already talked about the first two things that the atria did, atria depolarized during the P wave, atria go into systole during the PQ segment. Let's go ahead and finish off with the atria, and during the QRS complex, we get atrial repolarization, and we get atrial diastole. So the atria have done everything they're going to do so far now. But the third thing that happens is now that electrical activity has started to spread through the ventricles. So we get ventricular depolarization. During the QRS complex, we get atrial repolarization, atrial diastole, and ventricular depolarization. All three things happen during the QRS complex. Don't worry about when during the QRS complex each thing happens. Now we get to the ST segment. I call this the flat spot after the QRS. So over here, flat spot after the P wave. Over here, flat spot after the QRS. Later, I'm going to talk about flat spot after the T wave. Not technical terms at all, but it's able for you to visualize what I'm talking about. During the ST segment, the flat spot after the QRS, what do we think happens? Well, during the QRS complex, what happened to the ventricle? The ventricle depolarized. So during this flat spot after the QRS, during the ST segment, we get ventricular systole. The ventricles are contracting. Ventricular systole. And just so you are aware, you must use systole, diastole. You must tell me which part of the heart you're talking about, atria or ventricle. So on an exam, you can't just say the heart contracts. You must say ventricular systole or atrial depolarization or atrial diastole, something like that. So here in the flat spot after the QRS, the ST segment, we get ventricular systole. The ventricles are contracting. Now we have the T wave. Take a guess what happens. Ventricular repolarization. 
and then we get this flat spot after the T wave. What happens here? Ventricular diastole. The ventricles are relaxing. So what I like to do is, I don't have my whiteboard up and running right now, but if, if we were in class, uh, I would draw one of these on the board and have this part right here. And I ask this part right here, I didn't say anything about this. We started with the P wave. What happens right here? Does anyone know? And I would ask for people to raise their hand and tell me. And a lot of students get a little bit confused. But really, right here, we're having ventricular diastole. Because this is this. This is when the heart is relaxed. This is ventricular diastole. The ventricles have relaxed. And then we do it all again. Okay? So let me go through it all one more time. And I'm just going to trace it. I'm not going to say where I am. Just follow the mouse pointer. Right at the beginning here, right before the P wave, immediately before the P wave, this is when the SA node depolarizes. So beginning with the P wave, we have atrial depolarization, atrial systole, and then all of this we have atrial repolarization, atrial diastole, ventricular depolarization. Now we have ventricular systole, ventricular repolarization, ventricular diastole, and we do it again. So that's what a, 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 a EKG should look like in a normal healthy heart, and you should have one complete tracing 75 times a minute at rest. But sometimes various parts of the heart uh, that should be carrying electricity can have malfunctions. And we start to have EKGs that look a little bit different and the heart behaves a little bit different. And what we get are something called arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are just rhythm disorders. The heart is not functioning the way that it should electrically, which interferes with its beat. Now there's a, oh good grief, there are so many of these. Uh, in nursing school you will actually take, I believe, an entire course just on uh, various arrhythmias. And, and you can get books on these. We are only going to go over very, very few of them. And even the ones we go over, when you get into your program, if you study the heart anymore at all, uh, I know in nursing school you will, you're going to see even the ones we talk about, there are going to be modifications. I am just touching on these in the most basic state. So first, fibrillation. Now there's atrial fibrillation, which is not a big deal. Well, it could be if it goes on severe enough, but generally not a big deal. And there's ventricular fibrillation, which you don't want to see. So first, atrial fibrillation. A lot of people have had this, and this can be the result, like I said, of the ectopic focus. This could, if, if a part of the atrial surface becomes autorhythmic on its own, uh, or it can be the result of other things. It is really, really common for people who use stimulant drugs like cocaine, uh, heroin, things like that, or caffeine, really, really common. I have uh, atrial fibrillation. I do not regularly use uh, stimulant drugs like cocaine. I, pro I promise I don't use cocaine. Uh, I do drink a lot of caffeine. I drink both tea and coffee daily. Uh, so sometimes I get kind of that flutter in my chest. And most people have had this, you know, at least occasionally. Uh, some people have it pretty regularly. But it just feels like your heart skips a bead and starts kind of fluttering a little bit. And that's atrial fibrillation. That's what we see up here. We have kind of these little quivers. Now, next we have junctional rhythm. Junctional rhythm is when the SA node is defective. So the SA node no longer functions. 
And when the SA node no longer functions, a few things happen. First, the AV node takes over. What does it look like on a graph? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that graph up here. It's in your lab manual. What we see is we are missing P waves. Remember, the SA node caused the P waves because that's what depolarized the atria. So we don't see any P waves. We don't see the atria depolarizing. The atria don't go into systole or diastole. And another thing that's noticeable is the heart beats a lot slower, 60 to 80 beats per minute. So that is junctional rhythm. And the treatment for junctional rhythm, well, what was another name for the SA node? The pacemaker of the heart. What happens when the pacemaker of the heart is taken out? You put in an artificial pacemaker. And an usually they just say so-and-so has a pacemaker, but really it's an artificial pacemaker. It's something that's functioning in place of the heart's pacemaker. And an artificial pacemaker, really it just acts like an SA node. It shocks the heart 75 times a minute. But something that a lot of people don't realize if they don't know someone with a pacemaker is it only shocks the heart 75 times a minute. Plain and simple, it shocks the heart 75 times a minute to keep it beating at that rate. It does not increase when you're exercising, it does not change. So you have to be very, very careful with strenuous activities because when you might need your heart to pump faster, it's not going to pump faster. Next, heart blocks. And there are so many different types of heart blocks. We are going to put them into really just three categories. And they're going to be numbered first degree, second degree, third degree heart block. And the heart blocks, the higher the number, the more problematic it is. So first degree heart block, what, what we're seeing is we're having more and more and more problem with the AV node. In a heart block, it's always the AV node that's faulty. And the higher the number, the more faulty the AV node is. In a first degree, that electrical signal that was generated by the SA node, when it gets to the AV node, typically it's slowed down a little bit in a healthy heart. The AV node receives it, and there's a little bit of a pause before the AV node then generates its own action potential. But in a first degree heart block, there's an even longer delay. So what we will see is. P wave, and then before we get to any sort of electrical activity in the AV node, the, the delay is longer. Now, up here we can see what that would look like on an EKG. Typically, we don't use first-degree heart blocks in a, in a graph because they can be a little bit tricky to see what's going on. Second degree heart block, this is when it starts to become a little bit more obvious. And over here, there's two different types. I'm not going to ask you the two different types. I want you to know just in general, second degree heart block, this is now the delay is longer still so that it's each beat there's a longer delay between the SA node firing and the AV node firing until eventually it's so long that we miss one action potential. So between the P and QRS, there's a long delay. Then the next P and the next QRS, there's a longer delay. And then the next P and the next QRS, the delay is so long that we have a P and then another P and QRS. So each beat, the delay between P and QRS is a little bit longer until eventually we miss QRS entirely and we have two P's in a row. That's second degree heart block. So the ratio of P to QRS should always be one to one. But in a second degree heart block, that ratio is off. In a third degree heart block, this is called a complete block, the 
P and QRS are completely out of sync. The AV node is completely destroyed in this case. So the SA node, it's controlling the atria just fine. The P wave is completely normal. It's happening 75 times a minute at rest. It looks completely normal. But since the AV node is gone, it's no longer receiving signals from the SA node. So what happens? What did we say happens when the AV node is taken offline? Who takes over? The bundle of hiss. So now the bundle of hiss is controlling the ventricles. The SA node is controlling the atria. The AV node is controlling the ventricles. And the A, I'm sorry, the SA node is controlling the atria. The bundle of hiss is now controlling the ventricles in a third degree heart block. And the bundle of hiss is in no way connected to the SA node. So we have the P wave appearing normal. The atria are acting normal. The ventricles are under control of the bundle of hiss, much slower than normal. And there is no sync between P wave and QRST at all. They are completely out of sync. And that's kind of a phrase to watch for is out of sync. That's the giveaway for third degree heart block. And what's controlling the ventricles in a third degree heart block? The bundle of hiss or the AV bundle. And here, this is not really important. This is, some students just like to have some visual to tie everything together. This is on page 723 of your textbook. And what it's showing you is everything that we've talked about today, all in one image. Um, so here it shows you on the EKG, the highlighted area is what's occurring. And then over on the heart, if it's red, this is the part of the heart that is depolarizing. And then green is the part of the heart that's repolarizing. So if you watch the red, it spreads through that autorhythmic area that we were talking about. And behind it, the green wave follows. Now the green wave is still passing down through here. It's just kind of obscured by the red in these two images. And then as the red starts to move on, which is what we see right here, we can see the green following behind it. And it shows you here on the EKG what's happening while this electrical activity is happening on the heart. So that was, I know, a longer lecture than you're used to right now. But that's where I want to stop. I wanted to get everything with electrical activity in, in one go. Next lecture is going to be starting to talk about, now that we know electrically how does the heart work, let's look to see how does the heart actually move blood. So we're going to look at how blood moves through the heart. We're going to look at uh, the actual uh, cardiac cycle. What does the heart do during one beat uh, physically, the mechanical events? And then from that point, we're going to start to talk about blood pressure. All right, so let this all sink in, and I will talk to you next time.